Um, could we speak to the court before the jury was in <coughs> Surely. Walter? Hold right outside the door. Yes, counsel. For the purposes of the record, I'd like to have the Commonwealth has officially arrested. Yes. I, I'd move for acquired finding. Um, I will withhold argument. You do not wish to be heard. I wish to be heard, but I do move uh, for acquired finding of all of the indictments. And, Mr. Glenny, do you wish to be heard? No, Your Honor, I don't. Denied. Thank you, Your Honor. Let's bring in the jurors. Jurors entering, all rise, please. Court is now in session. Please be seated. Attorney Secondelli. You are um, I'm ready to proceed, and I'd call on Dr. Daniel, please. Please. Sir, raise your right hand, please. So I'm going to swear a testimony to give to the court of the jury, and the issue is now pending between the Commonwealth and at the bar. It should be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help you, God. Yes, sir, I do. Good afternoon, Doctor. Good afternoon, Your Good Honor. Good afternoon, Doctor. Would you state your full name, please? My name is John Dano. The last name is spelled D-A-I-G-N-A-U-L-T. And what is your profession, sir? I am a forensic psychologist. And what is a forensic psychologist? Forensic psychology is the branch of psychology that applies the science of psychology to questions that come before courts of law. And what is your educational background, sir? I have a uh, bachelor's degree in a dual major of philosophy and political science, which I received cum laude from St. Michael's College in 1971. I um, have a master's degree in uh, clinical social work, which I received from Smith College in 1979. I completed two clinical practica as part of my master's program. Uh, one was at uh, an outpatient clinic of a psychiatric hospital, and the other was at uh, an outpatient clinic of a community mental health center. And then I uh, proceeded to undergo uh, my education and training uh, for a doctorate in clinical psychology, which I received from Bailey University in 1983. I completed three clinical practica as part of the doctoral program, uh, one was at an inpatient unit of a Veterans Administration uh, hospital. Uh, the second was uh, at uh, a residential treatment center for psychiatrically and behaviorally disturbed uh, adolescents. And the third was at an outpatient clinic of a community mental health center. And I then proceeded to my internship uh, as part of my doctoral program and I completed that uh, and received my doctorate uh, in clinical psychology. And your professional background, sir? Uh, prior to graduate school, I began work in human services at a residential treatment center for psychiatrically disturbed uh, children uh, and adolescents called the Hampshire Country School, located in Ringe, New Hampshire. I was a uh, child care worker and teacher there. Uh, following that, uh, I was uh, retained as a supervisor and then promoted to assistant director of another residential treatment center located uh, here on the Cape uh, called the uh, May Institute. After uh, several years of working there, I then went on to graduate school, as I mentioned a moment ago, for my master's degree and my doctorate. Following my doctorate, I was um, hired initially as uh, a forensic psychologist at Bridgewater State Hospital, uh, which, uh, as the jury may know, is the uh, maximum secure facility for uh, defendants um, before the court on various uh, criminal matters. I was a unit clinical director there for a number of years, uh, also a forensic psychologist that uh, evaluated uh, individuals that were uh, committed there for evaluation by uh, the courts in the Commonwealth, our Commonwealth. And I uh, was also an assistant director, medical director at the facility, uh, assisting the medical director in um, policies and procedures uh, for the operation of the clinical and forensic program at uh, Bridgewater State Hospital. When I left there, I um, was uh, hired by the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health 
uh, to uh, work as the director of the uh, Brockton Court Clinic. Um, all of the district courts and superior courts in our state have court clinics associated with them uh, for the purpose of providing uh, evaluations uh, to the court, um, either at the request of the defense counsel, prosecution, or the court itself, uh, with regard to individuals that are before the court. Um, and uh, as the director of the court clinic, not only did I uh, perform those evaluations, but I also uh, supervised uh, other uh, mental health professionals that were assigned to other uh, courts uh, around uh, primarily southeastern Massachusetts, but also including uh, here on Cape Cod. Um, during those years that I was at the court clinic, I was asked by the Assistant Commissioner of Forensic Mental Health uh, at the Department of Mental Health uh, to serve on his uh, senior staff uh, for the uh, development of the court clinic system uh, in Massachusetts. Um, it was getting a rebirth at that time. Uh, uh, that was in the 1990s, and um, the Department of Mental Health was attempting to uh, provide a resurgence to the court clinic system, and I was asked to assist uh, in the program development and policy planning for the uh, court clinic system. Um, I also was asked during the 1990s by the commissioner of the Department of Correction here in Massachusetts uh, to serve uh, on the Community Access Board at the Massachusetts Treatment Center for Sexually Dangerous Persons. Uh, this is a maximum secure facility operated by the uh, Department of Correction in our state to evaluate and treat individuals that have been deemed by a superior court uh, to be sexually uh, dangerous. I sat on the a community access board that made determinations as to whether the individual was uh, continuing to be sexually dangerous, uh, as well as to uh, any privileges within the institution that the, uh, that the resident was uh, requesting. And I also uh, supervised for a period of time the so-called qualified examiners uh, at, that, uh, at that institution. Um, for the last... Uh, um, approximately 30 years, I've also uh, served as a court monitor uh, under an appointment from the Bristol Superior Court in uh, conjunction with the Bristol Probate and Family Court uh, as a court monitor of a residential uh, treatment center that has been under uh, court oversight uh, during uh, this approximately 30-year uh, period. My responsibilities are to uh, ensure that the facility is um, uh, operating uh, according to uh, court orders that are uh, in place, and also to ensure that the uh, facility is um, operating according to uh, professional standards for uh, residential treatment centers. Uh, I maintain an appointment at McLean Hospital uh, which is a private psychiatric hospital uh, located in uh, metropolitan uh, Boston. Uh, and as uh, part of my um, affiliation with McLean Hospital, I hold an appointment at Harvard uh, Medical School in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, for which I uh, teach uh, interns uh, in forensic psychology um, on an annual uh, basis. Um, do you have any licenses, doctor? I do. I, I am licensed as a psychologist uh, here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, as well as in the state of Rhode Island. Do you, have you made any professional presentations? I have. I um, have been asked to speak or present um, on a number of occasions at the uh, Massachusetts uh, Bar Association the Massachusetts Juvenile uh, Bar Association, the Rhode Island uh, Bar Association. I've also been asked to uh, present uh, at uh, various uh, um, legal institutions such as the uh, Suffolk University uh, School of Law, uh, the um, uh, New England uh, School of Law. Uh, I 
um, have had the privilege of being asked by the Superior Court uh, Judiciary to provide uh, training uh, to them at one of their training uh, symposia. Um, and I have uh, provided a number of uh, um, interviews and uh, educational uh, explanations to various um, media uh, entity um, um, as, as I have been requested to do. Have you testified before as a forensic psychologist? Yes, sir, I have. And how many times, if you can? I would estimate approximately uh, 1,750 times at this point. And uh, what courts, again, briefly? Uh, briefly, uh, most all, if not all, of the superior courts uh, here in Massachusetts, uh, the majority of the district courts, uh, the majority of uh, the probate and family courts. I've also testified in the United States uh, district court uh, federal court, and I've testified at um, in cases that have been going on in other jurisdictions around the country. You testified in this court? I have. Uh, and how many uh, cases and how many times have you been called to testify by the defense? Uh, I don't tabulate those exact numbers, so I, I couldn't give you an uh, exact number. I would say between defense and prosecution, I've testified more being called by the prosecution than the defense. You, you say that again, more for the prosecution? I've been called to testify uh, more by the prosecution than the defense in cases. Now, um, do you know Adrian Lawyer? I do know uh, Adrian Lawyer. How do you know him? I was contacted by your office uh, in February of um, 2015. Uh, to conduct an evaluation of Adrian Lawyer. And, and to, to conduct that or undergo that uh, responsibility, um, what did you do? Well, uh, your office had asked me to conduct what we refer to in my field as a criminal responsibility, uh, responsibility evaluation, which has to do with the state of mind of the individual at the time of a criminal offense. So um, the uh, process of carrying out such an evaluation uh, involves a number of steps. And I embarked on those steps uh, with the assistance of your office. For example, um, I asked uh, for uh, related uh, documents to be provided to me. Um, and I reviewed uh, numerous documents and during the course of my evaluation that would include uh, the uh, official investigative reports, uh, police reports, uh, reports of that nature. I reviewed the grand jury uh, transcripts. I reviewed uh, Mr. Loya's Coast Guard uh, record. I uh, reviewed uh, his record from the Bridgewater uh, State Hospital. Um, I also reviewed um, a number of writings uh, by Mr. Loya and those would include um, uh, his uh, number of emails between uh, him and the victim. I reviewed uh, a document that he uh, wrote uh, entitled Lawyer uh, Wars, and I also reviewed uh, a letter, a very lengthy letter, uh, that he wrote in approximately February of 2013 uh, to the victim. Um, in addition, I interviewed, as part of my evaluation, I interviewed um, a number of collateral sources. Uh, those would include his mother. Uh, I interviewed uh, his father. And I interviewed uh, his friend uh, by the name of Jake uh, Heller. Um, and then um, I embarked upon a series of interviews, uh, clinical interviews, with Mr. Loya at Bridgewater State Hospital. I saw him on approximately 17 occasions, um, resulting in approximately uh, 43 hours of interview time uh, with Mr. Loya. And then subsequent to the um, formulation of my report, which is dated uh, January 14th of 2016, 
Um, I subsequently had the opportunity to review uh, two other reports, uh, one authored by Dr. Martin Kelly and the other authored by uh, Dr. Judith Edershine. I think that's a summary of the database that I had. That's how you went about um, assuming this responsibility, doctor. Uh, you, you mentioned these 17 visits with the defendant and uh, whatever, some 40 plus hours uh, sitting with him. Is that an important part of your um, undertaking? Uh, well, certainly it's a very important part of an, uh, a clinical enterprise to have clinical contact uh, with the uh, defendant or patient, depending on what the context is, but that's a very important part. Why? Well, there are a number of tasks that we, uh, that, that we carry out um, during those interview times. Number one, we're looking for some substantive material as to how the individual views the world from his or her uh, perspective. Uh, so we go through a lot of um, <coughs> questioning about the person's personal background, uh, family background, education, um, uh, medical history, uh, history of any mental health problems or, or treatment, uh, any prior legal proceedings, uh, such as prior arrests or uh, convictions. Um, so we're, that's one sphere that we're operating on during these interviews is, is trying to obtain uh, background information through his or her eyes so that as a clinician, uh, we have an opportunity to try to view the world as the defendant uh, views it. And then at the same time, uh, we're conducting what's called a mental status examination. Uh, the, uh, typically, the individual does not, is not aware that that is a secondary process that's going on, the mental status examination, uh, because uh, the individual is uh, not particularly aware that we're making uh, observations of uh, his uh, or her uh, behavior, um, the way in which they speak, the way in which they present themselves, their appearance, their thought process, their way in which they perceive things. Um, uh, their uh, behavior and demeanor, their way of relating to the examiner, their affect, which is emotional uh, context, and we're also looking at their mood. Uh, so that is a second process that's going on at the same time that we're obtaining the background information. Um, now with that, doctor, did you eventually um, form an opinion? And I, I probably should have said, in a criminal responsibility case, the other thing that we're, we're looking at during the clinical interviewing time is their uh, view of the crime and their view of their mental process uh, during the course of the actual crime itself. I should have said that. Did, did you eventually form an opinion? Yes. I, I, I did, yes. And, and do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty as to the defendant's criminal responsibility on February the 5th, 2015. I do. And what is that opinion? Um, Adrian Loya on February the 5th, in the wee hours of approximately 2 a.m. Um, of, of uh, 2015, uh, was suffering from what we refer to as a delusional disorder. It is a psychotic major mental illness. Um, that was uh, exacerbated by uh, a major depressive disorder, uh, but uh, primarily it is the delusional uh, disorder uh, that uh, deprived him of the substantial capacity uh, to appreciate the wrongfulness of uh, his actions at the time uh, or his ability to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. Is there another aspect of your um, opinion that supports that conclusion? Well, this uh, uh, culmination um, of the diagnosis that I've just outlined um, uh, was within the context of an individual that suffered for uh, most of his, uh, certainly his adult life, but even preceding that, there were signs of, of what we call a schizoid personality disorder. Um, and it's uh, not uncommon. Uh, in fact, research uh, has helped us to understand that many individuals with uh, delusional uh, disorder uh, have a pre-existing 
personality disorder. Uh, the most common of that, of the personality disorder, is, is paranoid personality disorder. But the second most common uh, uh, of the delusional disorder antecedents, that is the personality disorder antecedents, is the schizoid personality disorder. Um, so uh, this, this would be the diagnostic understanding of Adrian Loya that leads up to February the 5th of 2015. Um, you, know, you first indicated, um, I believe you said, uh, Dr. Delusional uh, Disorder. I did, yes. Now, did you use a particular diagnostic criteria um, when you came to that conclusion? I did. Uh, I followed the criteria of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual uh, uh, version, we're in version num number five now, so it's called the D, the, for short, uh, the abbreviation is DSM-5. Uh, do you have those memorized? Do I have the, uh, uh, all of the criteria? No, I, I don't. Uh, it's a very uh, voluminous document, uh, but I have a working knowledge of the document. Refresh your memory as it reflected in the DSM fives as to the criteria. Yes, that th those are the basic criteria of delusional disorder according to DSM five. DSM five, of course. Uh, on subsequent pages beyond that goes into a lot more detail to provide the examiner with further information elaborating those criteria. But those are the basic criteria, yes. Can you uh, briefly as you can, please, how these criteria, um, how you see those in Mr. Lawyer? Well, I guess I'll start with number one. Um, number one, as uh, uh, you may see, is the presence of at least one delusion, if not more, uh, that lasts for a period of at least a month uh, or more. Uh, in the case of uh, Mr. Loya, uh, what uh, transpired uh, with him uh, in my review of his case is as, as follows. In approximately uh, September of 2011, um, the victim came into uh, his uh, life when he was in Kodiak, um, Alaska, uh, on the Coast Guard base, and she was um, assigned there as well. I don't think, uh, frankly, we will ever know all of the reasons that played into what I'm about to tell you, but um, uh, for uh, what we do know is that Mr. Loya uh, became completely uh, taken with um, uh, the victim as a uh, person uh, who uh, eventually was going to become the very um, meaning of his reason to live. And in fact, uh, if uh, we have the opportunity to look at what he wrote to the victim in February of uh, 2013, that lengthy letter that I mentioned before, uh, you will see in there uh, the degree to which uh, he describes uh, the victim as truly being uh, superhuman uh, in uh, her influence over him, uh, and that she is the reason that he uh, was living. Um, um, and so it starts at that point and uh, becomes a delusional proportion insofar as uh, uh, no human being relies on one person to the degree that uh, uh, the victim became uh, uh, a, a uh, entity in his life. It, it's, it's irrational. Uh, it went far beyond what reason uh, would dictate. And um, as time went on, uh, after um, uh, an incident occurred in, uh, in February of 2013, uh, Mr. Loya uh, uh, became uh, one step further into the track of his delusional disorder. What happened in February of uh, 2000, uh, uh, in February 2013 is um, an incident where he reports that uh, the victim uh, made sexual overtures uh, to him. And his uh, experience of that event 
was uh, uh, completely delusional. He started uh, believing that um, uh, this was, even though nothing of a physical nature occurred, he started believing that uh, this was an event that constituted a uh, rape, uh, but not a physical rape. There, there was no physical contact in that sense, but a mental rape that uh, he uh, had experienced this mental rape as a result of her reported actions, and that uh, eventually uh, he feels that he must uh, uh, move forward with the authorities and file a complaint uh, with the Coast Guard authorities that uh, she had uh, uh, sexually assaulted him, again, in a mental sense. There was no physical contact in that way. But uh, he proceeds to do that. He files a complaint. Um, and, um, and then uh, he realizes that uh, what he's now done is he's uh, alienated the very person that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he had experienced as the reason for his life. He's cut her out by filing such a complaint. Uh, they were not to have any contact. Uh, they were not to have any more uh, doings with with one another, and at that point uh, he approach he calls the support line of the Coast Guard and asks he knows something is wrong with him uh, he 's having nightmares uh, about the victim he 's having crying spells that uh, he he cannot uh, control he 's having all of these motions which for a schizoid individual is very foreign to them. He calls the support line, and they uh, connect him with, uh, 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 they refer him uh, to a therapist. Uh, and he uh, starts uh, seeing the therapist, and um, uh, then he's transferred from, um, uh, from that base uh, in Alaska to uh, Chesapeake, and so the therapy ends. He does not have uh, any more therapy at that point. Uh, but he does receive the disciplinary notice from uh, the uh, Coast Guard that instead of what he perceives to be uh, the, the victim being a perpetrator of a, quote, sexual assault, he's now uh, determined to have been the perpetrator by having uh, taken advantage of his rank. Um, and he becomes, uh, at that point, uh, in my opinion, he becomes uh, unhinged to the point that he views uh, in a delusional way that justice is not going to be done uh, unless he, uh, he uh, takes care of the justice uh, himself. And he then, uh, for the next uh, many months, uh, basically uh, plots out, plans out, uh, with the underlying delusional basis, how he's going to mete out justice leading to February 5th of 2015. Doctor, talking about the delusional, dis uh, delusional disorder, is, is there a type that you've identified that's consistent with your diagnosis? Yes, thank you. There are several types of delusional disorder. In uh, my view, he has the persecutory type. Uh, he believed that um, uh, not only that uh, the victim was, um, he, he was having these nightmares, as I mentioned. Uh, he, there was an incident where his dog jumped, uh, a dog jumped on his bed. He thought that assassins uh, were being sent uh, by the victim. And the delusional, the persecutory delusional uh, process expanded. Uh, so then uh, in 2014, he started thinking that the Coast Guard uh, were um, uh, following him or tracking his, uh, uh, his whereabouts and his actions on the computer. And then when I met with him in February of uh, 2015 to June of 15, he still believed when I last saw him that Bridgewater State Hospital was infiltrated uh, by Coast Guard um, undercover agents uh, uh, f uh, uh, tracking him and monitoring and following him. He told you that in the very month where this, these alleged crimes have occurred, February 2015, you said? 
Um, about the Coast Guard in the hospital. I think that came in subsequent uh, interviews as time went on, maybe a, a few months later. Uh, but he did tell me about the, uh, the belief uh, that, um, that uh, the victim was uh, uh, engaging in actions against him. He, that was part of his delusional process, that she was doing things uh, behind his back, um, uh, and then it expanded to the Coast Guard. That's how you suggested it's prosecutorial type, and that's what you took just gave. Yes, sir, that's right. Now, Aiden, uh, when you were speaking, um, you likewise, likewise mentioned it was part of your, I believe, diagnosis, doctor, did you not, uh, the schizoid personality disorder. Is that fair? Yes, that's, that is correct. And uh, fair and accurate, I don't know how your eyes are, but uh, <laughs> diagnostic criteria suggested in the DSM-5. Again, there there are uh, there there are pages that follow those, but those are the basic criteria. Okay, and, and please, uh, in talking about that as part of your diagnosis of Mr. Lawyer, please tell us how it applies to uh, your diagnosis of uh, Mr. Lawyer and what he suffers from. Well, uh, uh, if if the members of the jury can see that, all right, it, it is a per pervasive pattern of detachment from social relationships and a restricted range of expression of emotions in interpersonal uh, settings. This, this is, um, to cut through the chase, this is the proverbial uh, loner. This is the person uh, that um, uh, has uh, few social relationships, uh, who uh, is more comfortable uh, being alone, uh, who spends a great deal of time in solitary uh, activities, um, who uh, has uh, very little, if any, of a uh, sexual life or romantic life, um, um, uh, and is very constricted in his exposure to the outside uh, world in terms of all of the opportunities that the world has to offer. Um, I, I should also say, however, that um, these are not absolute um, characteristics. And what I mean is that um, in, all, in all mental disorders, uh, we're all... <laughs> We're all human beings first, and, uh, and by that I mean that there's a great deal of variability and vacillation, and nothing uh, in human nature is 100% uh, absolute. So even someone that's diagnosed with a mental disorder, uh, are, there's going to be variation to the criteria or the symptoms that they have. Just analogously, when we have a medical uh, or health issue and we go to our doctor, Sometimes doctors uh, are a bit puzzled, uh, medical doctors, about what our actual diagnosis is because we have these symptoms but not all the symptoms and uh, we even get sent to a, a, for a second opinion sometimes uh, because the doctor's not sure. So it's similar in psychology. We, uh, we look for the, the overriding features, the features that are most definitive uh, being aware that it's not going to be absolute, it's not going to be 100% of the time. And the criteria is set forth in the DSM. It's not going to be perfect or fit any one individual. Well, the DSM says at the very beginning there's a precautionary note that these are guidelines. Uh, these are not, uh, this is not a cookbook. Okay, and now a couple of things you said moments ago about the schizoid doctor. Um, he still falls within that diagnoses even though we know about a fellow named Jacob Heller. He had a friend. Would you repeat? I'm sorry, Jacob, what's your question? Jacob Heller, does that name ring a bell? Yes, I interviewed Mr. Heller. He, you did. And what did you learn about his relationship with Mr. Lawyer? Well, uh, Mr. Heller uh, knew him since high school, and Mr. Heller uh, was uh, his friend. Um, and um, they would periodically be in touch with one another. It wasn't very often, and particularly in the last two years prior to the incident, uh, they had very little uh, contact. 
and Mr. Heller um, never thought that Mr. Loya would uh, uh, do what uh, he is alleged to have done in this situation, but he had, Mr. Heller did have some significant concerns uh, about Mr. Loya in terms of these very symptoms of the schizoid. Uh, he was a loner um, and um, had uh, not a great deal of, uh, of social uh, interaction. You learned that from the friend Heller. Well, I learned it from Heller, and I learned it from the Coast Guard interview. My goodness, they interviewed many, many people in the Coast Guard investigation after this, uh, after this incident. And my goodness, I mean, uh, the vast majority of people they interviewed that, know, that knew Mr. Loya all basically said the same thing, that he was um, a loner, had very little to do with people. And there were a few exceptions, but uh, the vast majority reported that. He was out on this base of Kodiak, Alaska, right? Uh, well, he was on various bases. Um, uh, Operative time, and we had this great incident again, as he described it. He was in Kodiak then, yes. Uh, you've surely heard of a report. There was at least one get-together at a local bar. At least one, right? Uh, oh, sure, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, I believe, besides that, um, in uh, September of, excuse me, in, in December of 2011, uh, the victim accompanied him to the holiday base party. Um, I think that was in December of 2011. Okay, you're, it's still consistent uh, with your diagnosis that we, he went to a party, but he's still the loner of solitary fellow that you've determined to be. Absolutely. I, I can't emphasize enough uh, the importance of understanding that human beings vary and uh, we're not going to be 100% absolute in any uh, mental disorder, no mental disorder. There isn't a mental health professional, in my opinion, that could stand here and say that a human being is going to meet 100% of all the criteria of a mental disorder 100% of the time. Now, um, I believe a secondary, um, and we haven't fully talked about it, Secondary was um, the psychotic um, major, was it depression, was it? Major depressive disorder started with him uh, in approximately uh, 2012. As I mentioned uh, to, uh, to you uh, a few minutes ago, uh, after uh, the report had been filed of a, quote, sexual assault by the victim, uh, as you might guess, there was not to be any contact uh, with them, between, between the two of them. Uh, and uh, he realized, as I also mentioned a moment ago, that he had now cut off uh, the very person that he held on to for whatever reason, for whatever psychotic reason, he had held on to her as the reason he was alive. Uh, he had now cut her off. And so we see after that point a major depressive reaction setting in that, uh, that, I, that I saw uh, in my review of his case getting worse and worse, uh, uh, such symptoms of, of um, uh, pervasive uh, depressed mood. Uh, he wasn't sleeping well. He was taking um, uh, over-the-counter um, 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 medicine, uh, cough medicine to try to sleep. Uh, he was taking, um, um, he, he was uh, not eating well, um, his, he was having feelings of hopelessness and feelings of, of helplessness. Um, so they were all classic signs of depression that got worse after that point, uh, right up to the time of the incident. And, and frankly, since the incident, uh, the Bridgewater record reflects that he continues to have a major depressive disorder, and they've committed him there uh, since uh, the incident. Just may I slow you down a bit? Um, you identified a point in time where you said this uh, major depressive disorder was um, the cutting off of the Lisa, I think you said. I think I said victim. Uh, and, yes. and, the, and it worsened from them. Can you identify for us a point in time when that the cutting off of the Lisa? Where yeah, that, that happened after he filed the complaint against her in um, approximately <laughs> February of 2013. Um, he, um, uh, and then another, the, the next worsening point of his depression occurred in July of um, uh, 13 when he received the, the disciplinary page 7 notification from the Coast Guard. Okay, can I just slow you down a bit there? Uh, there's the incident that he perceived of being raped 
Yes. Know, the rape of the mind. You said things uh, proceeded uh, worse from there, the cutting off of Lisa with uh, reporting it to the Coast Guard. Is that fair? That's fair. Were there other instances of uh, the worsening or examples of the worsening of his major depressive? Yeah, after he received the page seven uh, notification, the disciplinary notification. Okay, uh, that from, happened when he'd already transferred, correct? That's correct. He was in Chesapeake. Okay, uh, was that uh, receiving that of some significance to you in your diagnosis of Mr. Lawyer? Uh, it, it was. Uh, I think I mentioned before that once he received that, he experienced uh, that rather than, remember, he had the delusional belief that uh, that the victim was um, uh, a sexual perpetrator, a sexual assault perpetrator. He, he believed that. Uh, and, uh, and then when the page seven came out, the disciplinary notice came out, instead of her being held responsible as he thought she should be, uh, uh, he was being uh, notified that he was the wrongdoer. He was the perpetrator of a wrong. And at that point, uh, he, um, uh, his depression did worsen, to answer your question at that point, uh, and uh, I think uh, amplified his delusional disorder. Well, the amplification and the worsening of it uh, occurred, you said the beginning or when it started in, when was the rape, please, doctor? Uh, the, the, the mental rape that he describes was in September of uh, 2012. There were certain instances before he leaves Kodiak, that's fair? By the time he received the page seven, right? Yes, and uh, he filed the complaint in February, well, as I mentioned earlier, in February of 2013, he um, wrote this letter uh, to the victim. He gave a copy of the letter to her wife, um, and the, uh, the victim was very upset uh, about the fact that he gave a copy of this letter, uh, which included the information about her alleged uh, sexual overtures uh, to her wife. What, uh, what, what, if I can interrupt you, what was the, in your opinion, what was his reasoning for the, the, the giving the letter both to her and to the wife? I think that's a good question. Um, what he told me was that it, he felt that it was a matter of uh, justice, that the, her, the wife should know what his feelings were and what had transpired because he had the belief that the wife didn't know. Um, that's what he told me. As an examining uh, forensic psychologist, uh, that may have been part of it, but I also think that there was potentially a self-destructive uh, course to this whole process. This man was deteriorating mentally, uh, and I think he was throwing out flares, if you will, uh, trying to indirectly obtain help for what he knew was a deteriorating, or experience, I, I knew is not the right word, but experienced as a deteriorating mental state, throwing flares out. I mean, who, who that, that was, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question because it's a rather unusual thing to do, but he did it, uh, and as, as soon as he did it, the victim was very upset, understandably, uh, and, um, and it was at that point that she told him, I'm going to go to the superiors, to our Coast Guard superiors, and tell them what you're doing. Uh, and it was at that point that he filed the complaint uh, that she was a sexual assaulter. I think it's at the beginning of that letter, Doctor, where, where he uses such words as, I want you to know the truth. Want you to know the truth. And he goes on to say, you're uh, a super, you have superhuman, um, I don't want to misquote, but superhuman influence over me. And basically, this very lengthy letter paints a picture of that she's the reason that he's living. And that was the truth to him? And I believe it was the truth to him. You had the opportunity, did you not, um, to look at what, what's been termed or named the lawyer wars? I have. Have you read that document? I have. How long is that? Several hundred pages. <laughs> details in that, doctor? The details are... Um, is, it, is, is it detailed? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. And let's just talk for a moment about it. You read it. How long a period of time? Um, 
it's chronicling the, uh, basically the whole period of time with uh, eidetic memory of his interactions with uh, the victim. It also goes into some offshoots about his view of the world. Yeah, yeah. Tell me that, what kind of memory was it? The detail? What's that? I about? said eidetic. Uh, his capacity to remember the the details of what somebody was wearing or, or uh, the, the, the weather, it was just incredible. And is it uh, is significant in terms of his diagnosis? Well, it, it is in terms of the obsessionality. Well, it is on a couple of fronts. One is he's extremely bright. Uh, people just don't, in that sense, people don't usually have an eidetic, I certainly don't have an eidetic memory. Um, uh, it, it, it is striking just in and of itself that somebody can remember that amount of detail. Uh, but in addition to that, um, uh, there's a, an obsessionality quality to it. Uh, he, he was so preoccupied uh, day in and day out with this uh, injustice that he perceived, which was completely delusional, and, uh, and the fact, I think, also that he had lost uh, he had done in a self-destructive, self-defeating way. He had lost the very person that he thought was his reason for living. Uh, so for those reasons, there's, an obs there's a perseveration and an obsessionality day in and day out. This is the majority of what he thought about. You spent, you spent over 40 hours with him one-on-one, -on -one, doctor. Uh, over 40 hey, hours, yes. They were all one-on-one, -on -one, yes. Was, it, was he a fellow in, in your other sources of information that would be social and go out to bars? Did you ever find that in his background? Say it again? Go out to bars and restaurants? Was he the guy who goes to attends the parties? Well, I don't think I can answer it the way you've asked the question. Uh, okay. you, you've generalized it uh, like he's a party boy. He, he was not a party boy. Uh, yes, he did have a gathering at his house uh, uh, after uh, the alleged uh, incident. Uh, the, the, excuse me, the sexual incident, uh, alleged sexual assault, mental rape uh, assault. He had a party at his house, a get-together. He invited um, uh, the victim and her wife to come uh, to the party. Uh, they initially said yes, and then they changed their mind and said no. He was, he was uh, very uh, taken down uh, by that. Um, and it was just the next month, so that would be... Uh, November of, uh, so that, that get-together was in October. So the alleged rape was September of, of uh, 12. Uh, in October of 12, he invited them to his house and they didn't come. And um, Well, let me, let me he, slow you down. There was also uh, these morale gatherings. Not. There were morale gatherings. And, uh, there were get-togethers on the base. Okay. And, and knowing that, does that alter your opinion in any way about the fellow that you diagnosed uh, Adrian to be. No, I, I think I've already explained that uh, even someone with a schizoid personality disorder uh, is going to have instances um, that they're going to interact with other people. Uh, it's the predominant problem, I think the technical language in the DSM is pervasive pattern. Yes, it's pervasive, but it's not 100% of the time. And you also indicated when you, you said he was uh, worsening when he went into that depression, uh, you noted uh, the lack of sleep, weight loss, hopelessness. Is that fair? That's correct. And that, is that consistent with your diagnosis? That's correct, yes. Uh, now, just uh, briefly, in looking at his background and, and your diagnoses of Adrian Lawyer, and uh, briefly as it relates to his family, can you just tell us about that and how it supports your opinion and your conclusion about his diagnosis? Oh, sure. Uh, tragically, he had uh, a, a very uh, emotionally uninvolved relationship with his family members. Um, I, uh, I spent 40 hours with this man, so I, I think I, I know pretty well the way, pretty well anyway, the way he sees the world. He, his view is that his uh, parents... Uh, had uh, particularly his mother had very little emotional attachment to him. Uh, felt that his father kept pushing him to get socially involved, but he he just naturally, as a schizoid personality, could not 
uh, get as involved as his father wanted him to, uh, and uh, he felt he was a, a disappointment to his father. In fact, his father went on to marry and, and have uh, two other children. So he, uh, uh, Mr. Loy has two half, half-brothers, paternal half-brothers. And um, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, one of those uh, half-brothers, Ivan, uh, uh, Mr. Loya uh, feels uh, became the apple of his father's eye. In fact, uh, the last communication that Mr. Loya told me he had with his father, uh, his father mentioned something about going with Ivan to some sports event or something, and uh, Mr. Loya either thought or said, he may have said it or thought it, I'm not sure, but he, uh, I, I'm glad that you finally have the son that you wanted because I, I never was. Um, he had very little to do with his sister, his full-blooded sister, very little to do. He said that his sister had emotional breakdowns of her own. Uh, they never had a close uh, uh, daughter, uh, uh, sister-brother relationship. And he told me that his brother um, has mental problems uh, of his own and has a non-existent relationship um, with his brother. He has... Uh, uh, basically no relationship with uh, his um, uh, his mother went on to marry as uh, no relationship with uh, his stepfather of any uh, any uh, significance and he has no uh, relationship with his stepmother that his father married in fact <laughs> as a normal course in my work I asked for names and ages and so forth I, he couldn't even remember he couldn't even tell me this is a fellow with an eidetic memory he couldn't even tell me who his stepmother's last name was he remembered her first name Lydia or something but he couldn't remember her last name uh, briefly he was uh, from birth to about 10 years old with his now split parents he yes. lived with mother right yes but mother had moved or Yes, she moved to uh, Albuquerque, I believe. And then uh, from age 10 to 20, uh, who was he with? His father. And um, again, they're living in different states? They're living in different states, yes. And now take me from uh, uh, 10 to 20, the activities that he indicated to you that, was, that fits into your diagnosis? Please. Well, uh, basically what he told me is that by his early teens uh, that uh, he felt uh, completely unaccepted in the world, unwanted and unaccepted in the world, and he retreated into the development of a fantasy world. Uh, he spent a great deal of time uh, um, um, watching Star Wars. When that first started to come out, he was in his early teens. And um, he actually uh, envisioned himself as part, at times, envisioned himself as, as part of Star Wars. Um, and he described to me, uh, when I said, well, overall, what would you say about your family upbringing? Uh, he thought for a moment and he said, well, uh, it's, it, it wasn't uh, bad, uh, wasn't good. And then he drew an analogy. He said, uh, I suppose it's like a plant. Uh, you add um, water to a plant, and a plant grows. Uh, but you know, Dr. Dano, um, there's not much you can do with a plant. It just grows. Now, uh, some confusion here, Doctor. You, you talked about the delusional disorder, the schizoid, and you talk about now, unaccepted in the world, a fantasy world, or living in a fantasy world. Is that fair? Uh, by his early teens, yes. Yet by later teens, I mean, he graduated from school, did he not? Yes. And he, in fact, had a job. Well, he graduated from high school. high school. He dropped out of, he tried college. He couldn't survive in college. And uh, how does your diagnosis, is it consistent with him not proceeding in school or succeeding in school, dropping out of community college? Yes. How is it? Oh, well, uh, he could not attend to do, uh, well, the social environment, I think, was too much for him. Uh, he was not able to handle, you know, in high school, when you're still living with your parents, there's some structure uh, that, that kind of organizes your life. And when you go to college, uh, you're much more independent. And I think uh, that was one reason why he didn't survive, was uh, that degree of independence I, uh, he, he's really not capable of. Uh, but the other thing was there's a lot of social interaction when you get to 
college, uh, and that was uh, distressing to him. And then the third reason is that uh, he really couldn't, uh, con he never could concentrate well even in high school or earlier grades uh, on his homework, and, um, and that's a big part of college. That's consistent with your diagnoses that you gave us here today? Well, it is. I mean, I'm not saying everyone with schizoid personality disorder doesn't get through college, because many do, uh, but that kind of problem that he was having would be consistent. Um, and and uh, other uh, times now going through high school and on to college, uh, do you know of any athletic events he'd attend? Or, no, or the, only, the only extracurricular activity he had was swimming in high school. And of course, uh, swimming is a solitary activity. There's no, you're not working with a, uh, you're working very little with a team. It's a, it's a single competitive event. Um, and he did fairly well uh, by, uh, high, I think, his senior year. He may have come in second or something in his competition. But that's a very solitary uh, event. Uh, he had no other uh, um, extracurricular, formal extracurricular activities and spent his time mostly, as I mentioned earlier, watching Star Wars or being on the computer. And uh, uh, he goes on to tell you how he did with grades in schooling. His grades were not good. His grade, as I mentioned earlier, he wouldn't, he wouldn't do the homework. Um, now going on, and again, I just want to touch briefly, um, surely many people watch Star Wars or movies of that nature, right? I've done it myself. And, uh, but you said he almost living in a fantasy world. Can you just explain that to us? Yeah. Um, uh, there, there's a term when you watch movies, the... Uh, the um, the uh, temporary, uh, uh, when you watch a movie, it's the temporary interruption of disbelief or something, I don't remember the phrase, something like that, like temporarily you put yourself in the movie. But, but all of us have the ability to take ourselves back out of the movie when we go home and live a normal, rational life. But someone who is on the edge of, of um, uh, schizoid personality or um, even worse, doesn't have that ability and can actually uh, experience themselves in the fantasy world. Where you and I, at the end of the movie, we go home, we're out of this fantasy. Is that what you're suggesting? Yes. Now, um, <clears throat> another part in his maturation process, I think you identify, sir, uh, that he was subject to some ridicule and bullying. Could you just brief briefly tell us about that? Yes, he was... Um, um, ridiculed and harassed from what he told me in school and his parents, one of his parents, confirmed that with me. Uh, he um, uh, was called uh, Lurch. Uh, he was called um, Mute because he, he didn't speak uh, very much. Um, and there was an incident uh, with uh, a peer that was ridiculing him. He did have a fight with the peer. Um, and I believe, if I remember correctly, his mother told me that she tried to get some counseling for him uh, around that time, uh, but his father uh, thought it was just part of the maturation process um, and didn't support the counseling, and so it did not proceed. And did you identify a point in time uh, that he was avoiding interaction with others during that same time span? Yeah, I, I, I think I've already said that he just spent most of his uh, free time out of school uh, with Star Wars or the computer. Now, it, it, again, or being, later, in a, being alone in his room. Later on, he became interested, sir, um, with the Coast Guard. What, what is it in his dynamics, please, sir, and your diagnosis of him that made the Coast Guard attractive? Uh, well, he told me, and it's consistent with his diagnosis, that the Coast Guard offered what I was mentioning earlier about uh, going to college and being more on your own. Um, well, the Coast Guard would be the opposite. The Coast Guard is very structured. The military is very structured. It's very uh, organized. And uh, the individual can, uh, that is seeking, who, who doesn't, who has an absence of independent functioning on their own, uh, can gravitate toward the military because it, it substitutes for that, compensates for that, it provides the structure. Uh, you don't have to think much on your own. Now, um, just, uh, just briefly, and let's, let's call it the pre-Lisa times, there were instances he may have even uh, dated 
uh, women and his relationship with other women. Can you tell us about that? Yes, he, he did date perhaps four or five times. He had two what he considers to be serious relationships, although they only lasted uh, uh, several months. They were not very long term, but he considered them serious. One uh, was with a woman that uh, was a bit older, uh, when he was about 20, I think. And uh, 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 she, um, I believe, uh, left him. Uh, and then the second one um, uh, was shortly after, and uh, she did not want to be attached to a military person, and I think um, uh, she left him for that reason, if I remember correctly. Did he, indi uh, did he indicate or conclude with you uh, that he liked that time with women or being with women and the relationships? Uh, I, uh, yes, there were times that he felt uh, some degree of closeness and that was appealing to him, but the pervasive pattern of his detachment was always the reigning uh, problem. And uh, so eventually those relationships uh, would not uh, survive. And also sexually, I should probably mention that there, he certainly has had sexual relations, uh, but what's interesting is he describes what he likes about the, the times of sexual relations is not the sexual act, but the, the, the closeness of the, the physical touch. Um, that's what he's, he was yearning for, not the sexual act. Okay. And, um did you or did you ever speak to him about um, his particular dog, Tony, and their relationship briefly, Doctor? Uh, he spoke to me about it, certainly. And could you uh, briefly tell us about that, his, his relationship with the dog and its culmination? On his way from um, Kodiak uh, to Chesapeake, uh, he stopped by uh, his father's house on the way um, uh, from that part of the country to this part of the country. And uh, his father wasn't home, uh, if I remember correctly, and he went to the backyard and he saw his uh, dog to whom um, uh, he was extremely attached um, uh, in deplorable uh, condition um, and near death. And um, uh, he ended up uh, having to euthanize uh, Tawny, and that was um, on his way to Chesapeake, and that was um, extremely emotionally difficult for him. Okay, and that was on his way now to his new assignment, was it not? Yes. And um, I just gave you some background uh, uh, before the lease and the encounters, so I kind of took a step back, and I'd like to go a bit uh, forward now because you um, briefly touched on the fact that his understanding of what happened the night with, with Lisa was in fact delusional. Can you just tell us a bit more about that and how that fits into your conclusion and your diagnosis of Mr. Lawyer? Well, the delusion started with, as I mentioned, that letter uh, as evidence. Um, uh, started with his view of her as the reason that he was uh, living, alive. Uh, that she had superhuman uh, influence, a very important letter to read, uh, to, to see uh, the world through his eyes. Um, and then, uh, after uh, the filing of complaints and the severance of the relationship with her, she became uh, the, uh, the, 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 the all bad person for the mental, the sexual mental rape, or whatever you want to call it, uh, that she had perpetrated against him. And then the third stage of the delusion would be uh, when he received the disciplinary notice that he was the wrongdoer um, and not her. Uh, he felt that he, uh, uh, much like uh, the characters in Star Wars, that he had to take uh, justice into his own uh, hands uh, in order to uh, make the world correct. He, he told me about um, uh, Captain Khan and uh, Captain Kirk in Star Wars and the, the bitterness with which Captain Khan would fight against Captain uh, uh, Kirk uh, uh, beyond all reason that uh, Captain Khan would stop at nothing to uh, try to um, overturn Captain Kirk. Okay, now... Um, I'm going to interrupt you for a minute, Mr. Secretary. Jurors, why don't you take five? A little stretch will do you good. 
Thank you, Your Honor. No problem. All right, tick five. All right, bring down the jurors, please. Uh, Judge, I told him he could bring his water, and I said, it's fine with the court. I told Dr. Daniel to bring his water, and he asked me. No. All right with the court. Anything else you want me not to do? Not right as far as running the place? No, Your Honor. Okay. Let's bring down those jurors. All right. While we're waiting for the jurors, there's a few that are using the facilities. Commonwealth, what do you got for requests for charge? Anything? Uh, I th other than the, what I assume the court would normally gives in these cases, we've agreed, we've decided to uh, withdraw any fe um, felony murder at all. Okay. And uh, we w I would request that there be an instruction given on a lack of license. If there's lack of evidence of license, you can infer that there isn't one. If there's a lack of evidence of a license existing for, for the, the gun, for the, the firearms? Well, I think he's only charged with, with ammunition charges. But yes, that you can infer that he did not have one it, because that is well, a there's the large capacity devices. Right. I think I think part of it is that you know you don't have an FID card, and, and if that's a license and that's an affirmative defense, and if there's no evidence of license, you can infer that there isn't one. That's all. Okay. Now, as far as homicide and a lack of responsibility, I hope you're both aware that there are draft revisions to the 2013 Blue Book edition that are being circulated. Your mutina didn't include it, Mr. Sagadelli. The one? Not, you're, you're not up to date on your mutina instruction. I'll take the new one then, Your Honor. And I want to caution you that the old saw about the presumption of sanity is out. Lawson, there was a case, Commonwealth versus Lawson by the SJC uh, in the past year that eliminates that. So don't, you know, don't argue it to the jurors. I did not intend to. Okay. Let's bring in the jury. Jurors entering, all rise, please. The court is now in session. Please be seated. <coughs> Doc, did you have the opportunity to review the volumes of uh, Bridgewater State Hospital records? Yes, sir. Did you see that he was prescribed at some point, uh, I believe it's termed Respirol? Respirol? You're close. And what is what is that? It's an antipsychotic medication. Um, now, Doctor, um, uh, you you aware of the diagnoses of avoidant personality disorder? A am I aware of it? Yes. Yes. A and did you take it into consideration when you looked at all of the material and you spoke for over forty three hours with Mr. Adrian Lawyer? Um. Did I take that diagnosis into, into consideration? Into consideration whether or not it applied to him. Uh, I, uh, I guess in a backhanded way, I never thought it did apply to him. Okay. Why? Well, uh, there are several prongs to the avoidant personality uh, disorder. Social, uh, pervasive pattern of uh, social uh, inhibition, uh, feelings of uh, inadequacy, and a hypersensitivity to negative evaluation. Uh, and remember, this is a pervasive pattern. And prior to uh, his um, encounters with um, the victim, uh, he, I suppose you could say he had some social inhibition because we're certainly uh, seeing the difficulties that he had. Uh, I'm seeing it pervasively as detachment. But I suppose you could see it, see it as social inhibition. But what he did not have was um, feelings of inadequacy. Uh, he uh, uh, was enough detached from people that he, he basically, for most of his adult life, didn't care what people think. And he was not hypersensitive to negative evaluations until uh, his encounters with, um, uh, with the victim. So for, for most of his adult life and uh, starting in his uh, childhood and adolescence, uh, he, 
he really uh, did not uh, uh, have those problems. So I, I did not see that diagnosis as relevant. Let me ask you, the what? chief overriding problem that he has is detachment from, from other human beings. You said, though, hypersensitivity to negative. Um, we did see that. After, yes. After yes. what? After he, was after he became involved with the victim, yes. And the victim's filing of complaint against him. Uh, doctor, did you take into consideration and review the potential for uh, borderline personality disorder? And please explain to us what that is. A borderline personality disorder has several features uh, to it. Um, uh, one is instability in interpersonal relations. Uh, I suppose um, we could agree that th th there is that element uh, in terms of if you want to in interpret detachment from human relationships as a, um, as um, uh, a, a, um, a problem in in that area, okay. But the other features of borderline personality disorder uh, he doesn't meet, and that would have to do with his um, uh, self-image. Uh, again, prior to um, uh, his contact with the, the victim, he did not have a problem with his self-image. Uh, he uh, basically withdrew from people, so he uh, didn't have that difficulty. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the instability in affect, uh, he, although there were punctuations where he would get angry, uh, most of the time he was very flat, as he was during my examination of him over all those hours. He cried at points, but mostly he was very flat in his affect. People with borderline personality disorder are all over the place emotionally. They're up and down. It's very unstable. Uh, they're unstable in their interpersonal relationships. Um, and, then, and then the other criteria for borderline personality disorder is impulsivity. Well, this individual is the last person that you would see as impulsive. Uh, everything is uh, plotted and planned and organized uh, to the nth degree. There's hardly any impulsivity to him. He, he doesn't meet that diagnosis. Okay, now let's get, let's get in. We gave a background, uh, gave a lot of uh, material you learned from your hours with him. I'm, I'm bringing you up closer to the event, and we'll start. In the October of 2014, there was a uh, particular trip that he made. Please tell us about that from Virginia up to Bourne, Massachusetts. Uh, he, um, uh, at that point, had, uh, had uh, uh, reached the point in his delusional state where, he, as I mentioned earlier, he determined that he was going to have to uh, mete out uh, justice. Uh, against what he viewed to be as a very dangerous person, the victim, uh, for her uh, mental sexual rape of him, uh, and uh, he was going to have to serve justice. Uh, as part of his plan, he decided he would have to make sure that uh, he knew uh, where the victim was, uh, lived, um, and he took a trip in October of 2014 uh, up here to the Cape uh, from Chesapeake uh, to um, uh, make those uh, reconnaissance uh, observations. Uh, well planned out, studied, Google mapped. You took that all into consideration? Yeah, I did. And uh, fits into your diagnosis and the diagnosis you gave us of him today. Absolutely. The delusion... I mean, we have to understand, I, I don't think we got to the second prong on the delusional disorders. We got off talking about the first prong, which is the delusion. But, but the second prong is that um, if somebody with a delusional disorder looks perfectly normal, uh, other than uh, when you prick the delusion. Uh, otherwise, they don't appear bizarre, like somebody with schizophrenia. They don't appear odd. Yeah, it's, the, um, it's number C. Apart from the impact of the delusion, functioning is not markedly impaired and behavior is not obviously bizarre or odd. Um, so people with a delusional disorder, uh, thank you, people with a delusional disorder uh, uh, can appear perfectly normal until the delusion comes uh, to the forefront and, and the other person becomes aware of it. Uh, otherwise, they can appear quite normal. So the, the planning and, and the, the plotting is entirely consistent with a delusional disorder. Does something particular happen on his return trip from this October 
reconnaissance mission? I think so, Mr. Segardelli. I, I think that that particular, he had a panic disorder, um, which uh, is very important to observe. Uh, and I think it's important to observe because in my analysis, after all these hours with this individual, I think that that showed the, uh, in, in a dramatic way, the psychic uh, tearing apart uh, that he was experiencing, the tearing apart of his mind. Uh, he was uh, in such a mental uh, quandary uh, about whether he should proceed with his, quote, mission, that I'm sure members of the jury have heard that, uh, that he conceived his, himself being on a mission to, uh, similar to Captain Kirk, to right the wrongs of the world that this, that this victim had perpetrated. Um, that uh, he, um, uh, he was on, on the one hand on that mission, and on the other hand, there was uh, another part of him that uh, this was uh, uh, not who he was. And I experienced my view of that as a splitting apart uh, of his mind. Um, and it was very dramatic, I thought, to, to observe. But it also, it manifested itself, did it not, Doctor, in him physically? You're talking about the mind, but we saw it in the hands and so on and so forth, did we not? Yeah, they had physical manifestations, yeah. And you were obviously considered whether or not this fellow was malingering or faking any and all diseases, right? Uh, well, I, I did consider that. A forensic psychologist or a forensic psychiatrist should always consider that. Uh, but <laughs> what I came away with is this man uh, wrote down uh, and laid uh, observant for all police authorities, all uh, uh, authorities and, and all members of the jury to see everything that was in his mind. He wrote Lawyer's War, some 200 pages. Uh, he recorded uh, much of his activity. He recorded the event, the very tragic, horrible event in that, in that house that night. He recorded it. Uh, this was not somebody who was trying to hide something. And, uh, likewise, now after that point, he's, he, again, you said there's a period, there can be a period of normalcy he managed to drive himself back to Virginia, did he not? After the, uh, you're talking about in October of 14? Yes. Yeah, after the panic attack subsided, uh, he did. And now there's a span of time between um, that October reconnaissance and coming back here sometime on or about February 2nd of 2015, right? Is that Correct, correct? right. Now, did he have the ability in that time to stop and put him into this, this mission, this operation? Interesting question. I think there's a yes and no answer to that. Well, maybe I can uh, assist you with this as you think about it. Um, the ultimate operation of the plan designated a particular a date that it was going to accomplish this task, did it not? Oh, sure. He had planned it on his birthday. Okay. What, what birthday was it? It was going to be his 30th birthday. Is there some significance to that? It's a milestone in most people's lives. Um, the decade uh, birthday is usually a milestone. And whether or not he could... And he, and, and he planned to die, uh, as I'm sure the jury knows, he planned to die after that. Please, please, how does that fit into his plan and his operation and his mission, his, the culmination of his life, Doctor? I don't understand the question, um, sir. Well, again, he, you said he was avenging a wrong. Your words, mete out justice, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. But there was going to be, again, lack of better words, a final chapter of him dying. There was, How yes. does that fit into your diagnosis of his particular mental disease? Well, at, uh, it fits into my diagnosis of the delusional disorder insofar as uh, once he had taken away the, uh, keep in mind, this not only is the enemy, but it's also the only person that he's alive for. It's both. Uh, once that's uh, done, uh, he had no reason to live. Enemy and only reason to live? Is that what you said? Both, yes. Now, whether or not he could stop himself, he drove up in that February and checked into a particular hotel, did he not? Yes, he did. Again, um, somewhat normal, presumably. Well, a well no, wait, no, no, not normal. He had uh, what he thought was a religious experience on the drive up. Tell us, please, about that. Uh, his car uh, broke down in, uh, I think, Scranton, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, he started thinking that 
that this was some sort of omen, that the breakdown of the car uh, was a spiritual message, some sort of omen to him, that maybe he should abandon uh, the, uh, the mission. Um, and then uh, uh, the more he thought about it, the more he felt that he had to continue with the mission. But that was a significant event along the lines of the question that you just asked me. So it, 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 going back to my question of whether or not he could stop it, he, he I was said looking yes. at a way to stop the train. Uh, yes, I, I said yes and no. He had that ability to your question, yes and no. Uh, and at points, he was looking for a way to stop it. There's no question about that. And that would be one example in Scranton. And, and were, was there other uh, examples of something that may have put an end to it? You said this religious and or car breaking down. Any others? Uh, yes, uh, when he was in the, the room itself, uh, when the horrible event occurred, uh, there was a moment uh, that he... Well, we'll get to that in okay. a moment. Let me just... Well, you before asked. Before so we get I was into trying that, to answer. was there a buying of a lottery ticket or another omen? Where have you told you about? Uh, I don't think I discussed the lottery ticket with him. Okay, well, did you discuss the potential for a, a one-time associate or friend having been maybe reassigned to his base in Chesapeake? Do you recall that? No. Okay. I don't recall that. I'll call your uh, attention now to uh, February the 4th on that evening. There was a retrieval of uh, what's called a tree or a, a deer camera or something like that. Do you recall that? I do recall that. In fact, did you watch a video of that happening? I did. Okay. And again, it's, it's part of his documentation of this entire event. Is that fair? Well documented, yes. Tragically. Now, um, t taking us up to that, and you viewed all of those videos along with the panic attack, correct? Yes, sir. Um, take us now from um, putting, how do those, uh, you know we put these hoax devices in and around uh, that particular apartment before going in, correct? Well, you put the, the car uh, to stop traffic and, and blew it up. Um, and you put devices in other places. You put the boom box uh, 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 under the mailbox, the boombox was programmed with um, Star Wars songs, uh, Batman songs, James Bond songs. Those were all supposed to go off uh, as he was entering the house, which didn't go off. And it was a puzzle to him when I was interviewing him. He didn't know, he couldn't remember, did he push the button to start it when he went into the house? Um, or did he forget to do it, which wasn't like him, but for whatever reason, when he came out of the house, uh, the music wasn't on, and so he said it at that point. Now, um, once in the home, uh, the mission or the plan was derailed again, was it not, Doctor? Tell us about being in the room. Um, uh, it, it potentially derailed, you're talking yeah, about? Yes. Yeah, he... he um, uh, when he um, uh, saw, uh, w when he was recognized uh, by uh, the victim and her wife, uh, he wasn't sure who originally uh, recognized who it was, but he took his mask off at that point when they called his name. Is that you, lawyer? And um, uh, there was uh, direct face-to-face uh, -face contact at that point. Um, but interestingly, uh, he as you, you'll see in my report, he, he, when there was that direct contact, he saw, uh, frankly, I'm not sure if it was a hallucination, but it, it sounds like it. He, he kept seeing an X, a black X, across the victim's face. Uh, it could have been an illusion, it could have been a hallucination, but uh, that was prominent in his description. He kept seeing this X on her face. But regardless of that, he did have a moment where he thought that uh, he had accomplished the task by putting uh, her on notice, putting fear in her that justice had been done, and that he didn't need to proceed with the complete mission, uh, and he could stop at that point. Um, so there was that additional point where he was looking for a way to stop. Well, he did, he did, pursuant to speaking with him, your other information, looking at the video, actually come at her in the bedroom and actually got within an arm's length of her, did he not, doctor? Yes, sir. And what part of his plan was to take a knife and either directly to the heart or perhaps the throat. Isn't that fair? Yes. I, Did he do that at that time? No, he sheathed the knife at that point instead. Okay. So, so the mission was stopped. It was stopped at that point. Is he in delusion point. at that time? What? Is he in a, his delusion at that time still? 
To the extent that he thought that justice, he had accomplished his mission, he was still in the delusion. He thought that he wouldn't have to proceed with the entire mission. He had accomplished the goal of putting fear in her that she now knew justice had been done and he wouldn't have to proceed with the complete mission. But the mission was still the mission. So that's still within the delusional disorder. Looking at her eye to eye, he could not complete the task. Is that fair? For that moment, that's, that's correct. What then happens, uh, Dr. Daniel? Uh, then he sees a cell phone uh, being dialed or present uh, by uh, the victim, uh, and he fires a warning shot. Uh, the warning shot into the mattress. The warning shot startles him. Uh, he um, sees the flash, hears the intense sound of a gunshot, um, and has the experience at that point that things are getting out of control. The mission is getting out of control. He has to bring it into control. And then uh, he sees the mattress uh, come up uh, at him, and it was at that point uh, that uh, he completed the mission. Was it your diagnosis and his mental disease in effect at that point? At that point, yes. Well, I think it was in effect throughout that whole experience in that room, but uh, at that point he decided he had to complete the mission to its entirety. And uh, after the discharge of that firearm, he left that unit, did he not, doctor? That's correct. Um, he raised the rifle and... That firearm, he left that unit, did he not, doctor? That's correct. Um, he raised the rifle and his intention was to go out to where he expected the police authorities would uh, shoot him. He held the rifle up as he went out. And uh, that was his, in his mind, in your opinion, doctor, his paying for this act? That's an interesting question. Uh, you mean paying for Zach being shot by the police? Yes. I'm not sure it's as simple as that. Well, could you go, um, could you tell us your thoughts, please? I, in my opinion, as I mentioned earlier, uh, he didn't have any reason to live. Uh, I, I didn't see it so much as, as punishment or, or payback uh, in that. I saw it as he had no reason to live anymore. The, the person that he was living for was now deceased, was now dead. Uh, and he had no reason to live. Uh, the Coast Guard was over with in his eyes because of the page seven, that's fair? Again, uh, yeah, that, that is fair. And again, uh, it borders on the delusional disorder because uh, the page seven was certainly, uh, I'm sure within Coast Guard uh, life, uh, a very significant event, but yet he had received uh, reviews of his work in 2014 that suggested that he could re-enlist. Um, so even though he had the page seven, it's not clear to me that it was really uh, true that he wouldn't have been allowed to continue just because of the page seven uh, when he had all these good reviews. Um, so he, he took it upon himself in, I think, April of 2014 to himself say to the Coast Guard, despite those positive reviews, that he was not going to re-enlist. Okay, now something likewise in his in, in his mind. You're, uh, did you take it into consideration his um, now belief about law enforcement, or his changed beliefs about law enforcement? He did feel yes. He did feel that um, after the uh, quote injustice that had been decided by the Coast Guard, uh, he did uh, he described to me doing a lot of reading about uh, police. Um, uh, uh, taking matters into their own hands on uh, uh, when on the scene of a crime, and um, he, he started developing this idea that that police authorities were not to be uh, trusted anymore either, uh, and that they were not, uh, and that they themselves were perpetrators of injustice. And how can you describe to us how that spun into this delusion about the Lisa effect? Well, uh, again, injustice had been done uh, he, in his mind uh, by the Coast Guard, and he expanded it to now include, uh, well, it started with uh, the victim and then the Coast Guard, and now all police authorities, in his view, uh, were uh, potential 
handers out of injustice. We talked briefly in, in about the uh, panic attack videotaped, and you read it. Were there other panic attacks you were made aware of and you looked at? He had a number of panic attacks over the course of all this time that we're talking about today. And one, did he uh, explain to you about, in fact, falling down on a, ba on a bathroom floor <coughs> in, in tears and so on? Yes. Now, um, again, the, the, the music, in the, he played that music, but it actually never... Oh no, it did. When he um, uh, when he went back out from the house, he turned it on and uh, told me that um, I think it was the uh, I, I don't recall which song started. It was either Batman or James Bond. I think maybe James Bond. The significance of that, in, uh, Doctor, as it relates to your diagnosis, of Mr. Lawyer. Yeah, music. it's crazy. That's fair, Doctor. Now, you, you talked about, uh, towards the latter part of, of your report, Doctor, um, something about the vanquishing of the evil. I think we've gone over that. Covered that, that afterwards he, he felt relieved. Oh, he did. Uh, when I saw him, that I saw him about six days after yeah. the, the tragedy uh, at Bridgewater, and... Um, he uh, described to me feeling um, um, I guess flat, no feelings. Is that the same time he believed that the Coast Guard had agents watching him in in Bridgewater Hospital? As I uh, told you earlier to your question in that regard, uh, he uh, discussed that with me a bit later, not on that first meeting. Uh, in discussing the, the, the mission, did he tell you or explained to you and verified via the videos wearing the Star Wars patches and a, and a Star Trek badge on his chest? Yes. Was there some significance to being the purple rebel doctor? I think uh, there's some significance to this whole, uh, significance to my diagnosis of a delusional disorder to the whole uh, kit and caboodle. Uh, he um, was on a quote mission uh, to, to uh, avenge uh, justice. Um, he was, um, uh, it, w it wasn't just wearing the patches. When, when he left Chesapeake, he put Star Wars figures in uh, those cardboard life-size figures in his house in Chesapeake uh, so that when police authorities after the, the incident would investigate his house, they would, they would see all these Star Wars. Darth Vader was up on his balcony. It was... how, does, how does that fit into your diagnosis? Please. This is not a sane individual. Okay. Now, um, he indicated, um, Doctor, if you recall, leaving, um, leaving that condominium complex, he stepped back out into the snow. Do you recall him telling you about taking a sip of water? Yes, he went from the house uh, to where he had left a bottle of water. Uh, and he sat there for a few minutes drinking the water. Um, yes, he did. And did he mention that at that point, uh, Doctor, the movie had stopped when I took the sip of water? He did describe that to me, that he felt that he had been in some sort of uh, what we would, uh, I don't want to say dissociative episode, because I don't think I have enough data to say that, but he did describe that it felt somewhat like a movie when he was in there and when he drank the water. Uh, didn't feel like a movie anymore. And did he tell you, I mean, prior in your meetings with him over your many hours, he had self-diagnosed himself, had he not, doctor? He had, uh, yes, he had told... Um, so when he, uh, I think I mentioned in... Um, uh, April of 2013, after he had written the letter to the victim in February of 2013, and... Um, uh, she went. Uh, she complained to the superior officers about uh, the letter and what it had done to her and her wife. Uh, and uh, he had gone to counseling uh, in April of 2013, about a month later. And uh, he did say to the counselor, according to what he told me, we don't have those counseling records. I believe all of you tried to get them, but we never got them. But he said he told the counselor that he thought he had a schizoid personality disorder. Uh, at any rate, towards the latter parts of your meeting with him, and I believe you put it in quotes, 
Uh, doctor, he said to you, being ill is a horrible thing to have. Do you remember that? He did tell me that. No. Now, doctor, um, what is the uh, standard, the McCall standard, as you understand it, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts? A person is not responsible for criminal conduct if, uh, at the time of such conduct, uh, due to mental disease or defect, the person lacked the substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his uh, actions or conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. Now, pursuant to everything you've told us during your testimony, uh, your, your opinion, sir, uh, to a reasonable degree of psychological certainty, as it relates to uh, Adrian Lawyer in February the 5th, 2015, and criminal responsibility. Can you share that with us? In my opinion, um, after all the hours and review of the data, uh, he was experiencing a delusional disorder which deprived him of the um, uh, substantial capacity to appreciate. Appreciate is an important word in my training as a forensic psychologist. Um, appreciate means a full understanding of what you're doing. Uh, as a result of that delusional disorder, he did not, in my opinion, have a full understanding. He was operating within the experience of a delusion um, and therefore could not have the substantial capacity to appreciate what he was doing was wrong, appreciate, uh, or conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. Uh, if you said to, in my opinion, if you said to Adrian Loya, is killing somebody wrong, he would say yes. In general, that's absolutely true. Uh, but under the, uh, under the influence of a delusion, uh, he believed that what he was doing was, was right uh, and that uh, he was unable to stop himself. Um, and frankly, in my last meeting with him in June of 2015, he still believes it. Now, he also feels remorse about the loss of, um, of the victim, but he still struggles mentally with thinking that what he did was right. Now, I approach you. Uh, your, your evaluation is dated January 14th, 2016. Is that right? That accurate document? Um, without examining every page, this appears to be my report, yes. Uh, please, I'd like to add to that as an exhibit. No problem. Next number, exhibit. Uh, 139. All right. Uh, doctor, in your uh, direct examination, you indicated that you had done some publishing? Okay. Had some publications? No, I said presentations. Presentations. Do you have any publications? I have one with the late uh, Honorable Justice Rotenberg, uh, which is in the family court. And what was that? It was on grandparent visitation. Grandparent visitation? Yes. Any others? No, the rest have been oral presentations. And um, is it fair to say that most of your presentations have to do with children or sexual dangerousness? No, I think the uh, presentation at Suffolk University School of Law was on the insanity of defense. I think That's I've one. spoken several times on that. Go ahead. That's one. Um, That's most. Go ahead. That's one. Yeah, many of them have been on the topic of sexual dangerousness. And children. Some on children. All right. Well, let's go through them then. You uh, indicated you were an invited speaker, right? Mental health issues and divorce. Yes. Okay. Was the, yes. Invited speaker. Scientific foundation of psychological assessments in the juvenile court. Yes. Now, would that involve children? That would involve children or adolescents. Oh, so let's not quibble over children. When I say children, what age do you consider a child to have? Up to 18. 18. You invited panelists, uh, psychological effects of international child abduction. Yes. Extremely qualified, expert in sexual dangerousness. You were cited for that, right? What do you mean by cited? Uh, the um, Middlesex Superior Court Justice and the um, uh, Hamden Superior Court Judge uh, cited from the bench uh, that 
both of them were male, found me to be eminently qualified. Well, what does that mean, cited? Did they cite something that you had written? Cited something you had said? What does cited mean? During the voir dire qualifying me, they announced uh, that was the citation, that I was eminently qualified. Oh, so you just mean somebody from the bench accepted you to testify in the case by citing, is that what you mean? No, they, the, the, as I said, the justice said that I was eminently qualified as an expert. Invited panelists, demystifying the GAL process. What's a GAL? Jail is a guardian ad litem in the family court. Okay, so would that involve children? Uh, children and adults. Author, psychological effects of international child abduction. Would that involve children? Uh, children and adults. Obviously, the abductee would be an, a, would be an adult. Invited. The abductor, I'm sorry. The abductee would be a child. The abductor would be a, an adult. Invited speaker, psychological effects on child abduction. That involve children? Same answer. Same it would uh, is, children and adults. Is it the same uh, presentation? No, I think it was a different one actually. Invited expert, divorce wars. Yes, I was interviewed by CNBC in that topic. Into that was an interview. It was an interview. I see. Invited speaker, sexual offender evaluations in the courtroom. Yes. Okay, that was in Rhode Island, right? That was the annual conference of the Rhode Island Bar Association, yes, sir. Cited as experts sexual dangerousness, right? Is that, Does it, that might be the same one that we just talked about or one of the other ones. Would you have listed it twice? No, I wouldn't. So are you saying it is or it isn't? I'm reading, it. I'm reading your CV. Well, it would give a, a date, uh, Mr. Assistant District Attorney, would give a date and that would tell us whether it's the same one or a different one. 2008. Does it indicate which court that was? It does not. It says Supreme Judicial Court. Then I was cited by the Supreme Judicial Court as an expert in a particular case. Sexual dangerousness, right? I believe so, yes. Invited panelists, family law, case update. Right? Yes. Is that about children? I, I was both children and adults. Invited panelists, clinical experts in a custody case. Does that involve children? Yes, and adults. Invited speaker, toxic parent-child relationship in divorce. Would that involve children? Children and adults. Invited panelist, criminal issues in the district and probate courts. Would that involve children? Children and adults. Cited. A qualified expert in sexual dangerousness, right? That would be another time. I'm not sure what the date was of that. It would either be um, Hamden Superior Court or um, Middlesex. Invited speaker evaluating removal in Massachusetts. What's removal? Uh, requests by uh, caretakers to remove their children from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to another uh, domicile. Author toward an appropriate evalu evaluative pathway in removal cases? Same answer. Invited panelists, sexually dangerous persons. And then you mention the name of the case. I, I don't know without it in front of me uh, what that uh, forum was. <clears throat> okay. Then you have it cited again. Invited panelists, sexually dangerous persons. There's no duplication, so it would be a different uh, forum. So there was a panel that you were on for Channel 5 News, and there was a panel you were on for Newsnight, New England Cable News. Okay, that would be two different times. Two different times with the same topic, right? Same topic, sure. Sexually dangerous persons. Yes. Invited speaker, assessment of sexually dangerous persons, right? Again, I don't have it in front of me, sir. I'm not sure which the, what forum you're referring to. So do you agree that most of the times that you're citing here, which aren't even publications, are dealing with either family law, children, or sexually dangerous persons, right? Uh, well, you haven't read all of them, but uh, many um, of them are. Well, do I need to go on to show that most of them are sexually dangerous persons or involving family law, children? I agree that many of them are. But for example, you left out Suffolk University where I spoke on the insanity defense. Which is what you mentioned before, which is one. 
Right. And there may be others I'd have there to There may be others. Now. No editorial comment, Mr. Bonney. Ask a question. You are indicated, did you not, that the defendant was not criminally responsible, right? In my opinion, uh, he meets the McCool standard of criminal responsibility, a lack of criminal responsibility. And there's two prongs that is there not? There are two prongs, yes. And is it your opinion that he doesn't qualify under either prong as to being criminally responsible? He's not, he does not appreciate the wrongfulness of his acts, and he does not, he's not able to conform his conduct. Is that fair to say? You're, you're in short form, yes. Remember, it says substantial capacity to appreciate, as I testified earlier. But both of those uh, are problems for him in terms of a lack of substantial capacity to appreciate because of his delusional disorder. You know, this delusional disorder, how long has it existed with the defendant, in your opinion? That's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I think a date certain that it would have begun would have been the letter I referred to in February of uh, 2013 when he wrote to the victim and indicated that she was, uh, she had superhuman influence over him and was the reason for his life. So this is not a disorder that one has for their entire life, is it? No, it doesn't have to be, no. Does any biological components? That's another, a very good question. Uh, there's certainly research that would suggest that, but uh, in terms of uh, certainty, uh, we're not there. And you'd agree with me, wouldn't you, that there's nothing in any of the records that you review that point to anybody else prior to the date that you've mentioned, pointing out that he's got some sort of delusional disorder? No, what the data would show is the schizoid personality, uh, but not the delusional disorder. And when he wrote that letter, what delusion was he suffering from? Uh, um, at that point, um, the delusion would have been one, as I mentioned earlier, that she was the all good person for whom his life depended. And, and that she had superhuman influence over, over him. And you're saying that that goes beyond him just having a crush on her, right? Absolutely. And it goes beyond him just wanting to be friends with her, right? Absolutely. And it goes beyond him feeling that she would be somebody, that he would be upset if he, she were with somebody else, for instance, her wife. Absolutely. Superhuman speaks for itself. Well, how did you interpret that term, superhuman? As the letter goes on. It's a very long letter. As you know, I'm sure, uh, it goes on to describe the superhuman in many ways of her being the reason for his life. Well, any magical activities by her? No, he didn't mention any magical activities, no. Did he mention that she could do something like lift up trucks or something like that? No, sir. Did he mention something about her being able to read his mind? No, sir, he did not. Move objects without having to touch them? No, sir. So when you say superhuman, what are you referring to? The superhuman influence that, he would be, that she would be the reason for his life. That's not rational. Yeah, but what do you point to to show that there was some sort of superhuman activity on her part? You say she's the reason for his life, and it's superhuman. How? I think you have to take the whole letter in its context. He goes on and on, page after page, about the reason that she is uh, the per that, that she is the reason that he lives for. Well, the letter certainly does indicate he's fixated on her. Correct? Indicates that he's fixated on her. Yes. Oh, definitely. Yes. And he's obsessed with her. Correct? Absolutely. And somehow you interpret that to indicate she's got some sort of superhuman power? It's no. That those are his words, not mine. Right. So tell us what it is that would be superhuman about those specific effects. Well, he doesn't, he doesn't outline like the examples that you just gave. He didn't list those in the, in the letter. He went on from that initial paragraph of superhuman influence to describe how his life uh, depended on her. You met with him for 43 hours. Approximately. Did you ask him during any of those 43 hours what he meant by her having superhuman effect on her? 
I didn't ask about that letter, that term, but certainly over those hours, he described in many ways how he perceived her as being the reason for his life. Well, now, are you referring to when he wrote that letter or his overall impressions of her? I, as I said a moment ago, I did not ask him about that letter and the use of the word superhuman. But over the course of all those hours, he made it very clear that he perceived her as being the reason for his life. And so you do attach some significance to the use of the superhuman there, don't you? Given the totality of the information, absolutely. And yet you didn't inquire of him what he meant by that? I had plenty of information to go on based on what I just said. It was uh, elaborated over many hours. Now, you indicated that he admits that he had seen somebody in Kodiak I think you referred to them as a therapist, is that right? That's what he told me, and as I mentioned earlier, records were tried to be retrieved, but were unsuccessful. You knew who the person was? He gave me the name of Naya, Naya, N-Y-A something, I don't remember the last name. Social worker, right? I don't know. You don't know? Hmm. How did you try to attempt the records if you didn't know what her title were? Mr. Segadelli's office informed me that he, uh, a number of times that they were trying to obtain the records. I, I, I have the last name in my, my notes, I just don't recall it. The first name was Naya, and he gave me the last name. No, that's fine. I'm just asking you, did you know whether she was a therapist, whether she was a psychologist, a psychiatrist, or just a social worker? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I don't think he told me that or knew it. Do you know how many times you saw that person? Good, good question. Uh, it would be from uh, April of... Um, uh, 2013 to uh, maybe June when he was transferred to Chesapeake. So I think he told me around eight times. And did she provide a diagnosis for him? I don't know the answer to that. <clears throat> now you're getting paid to be here today, right? Yes, I am. And, and how much are you getting paid? Committee for Public Council Services set the rate at $180.50 an hour. And how much have you paid, been paid thus far? I don't know the answer to that. It would be considerable given how many hours I've put into the case. And when forming your opinion, did you consider whether or not Mr. Lawyer suffered from autism or Asperger's syndrome? I did after, I, as I mentioned in my direct testimony, I saw Dr. Kelly's report, so I did consider that after I read his opinion. And did you reject that? I did. I respect Dr. Kelly, but I, I don't think he's correct on that. <laughs> And you indicated also that you opine that he's suffering from the schizoid personality disorder. Is that right? In my opinion, that's the correct diagnosis, yes. And anybody else other than the defendant diagnose him with that? I don't know the answer to that. Now, you indicated that he'd have few social relationships if he was suffering from the schizoid personality disorder. Is that right? Few, yes. Okay. And the few that he would have, what types would they be? Uh, it, it could vary. Well, I mean, would it be somebody that'd be out there, the life of the party, uh, dancing, singing, or would it just be he's there, kind of hanging out in the corner? It could be both. For example, uh, if a schizoid personality uh, had something to drink and at a party, he could very much be dancing at the party. What if he did have something to drink? It's still conceivable. Okay, what about being a Santa Claus at the base? Is that inconsistent with being a schizoid personality? Not at all. As I uh, mentioned under direct testimony, uh, these are not hard and fast cookbook criteria. There's variation according to uh, human nature. And so somebody who's a loner could easily be the Santa Claus at a base park. Absolutely. I think uh, there, are, there are probably many Santa Clauses at malls who are in the loner spectrum. How about coaching a volleyball team? That's certainly conceivable. How about coaching a swim team? The swim team, uh, when he, uh, that, that's conce I mean, any of this is conceivable, but one in a diagnostic process looks for the pervasive pattern, not individual instances, the pervasive pattern. Right, so if, if one of these people that suffer from this disorder were to be a coach of a swim team, uh -huh. that's okay, it's one thing, right? But what if they were the base Santa Claus and coach the volleyball team and coach the swim team? That's all conceivable with still, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, comprehensive Coast Guard investigation that was done. They interviewed many people that knew Adrian Loya. And if, uh, if you take time to read through that, it's rather remarkable that they all basically, not all, 
so there were some exceptions, but most of them uh, characterized him within the symptomatology of a schizoid. So they certainly notified somebody that, hey, my friend Adrian Lawyer is suffering from a schizoid personality disorder, right? I'm, no, I'm talking about their description of him meets the uh, criteria. Right, they didn't notice anything that you saw that caused them any concern that he was mentally ill, did they? I don't know that I would say that. Some, if I remember correctly, some thought that uh, there was some significant problem with him. But they, I saw nothing that they went to the authorities and said, uh, you know, he needs help. I, although one of them might have said that they thought he needed help. I don't recall. You don't recall if they said it or you don't recall who said it? Who said it? Right. You also indicated that they have little exposure to the world if you suffer from that disease, correct? If I said exposure, I meant uh, interest in the world, other than their circumscribed solitary activities. So describe that a little more for us. What does that mean, that they have little interest in the world other than their solitary activities? Particularly with social interests, although there, as I already testified, there may be exceptions to the general rubric, uh, but for the most part, they're not interested in social activities with other people. So it's not like world history or anything like that. You're talking about actually socializing, right? When you say that? I, I don't know what you mean by world history. I'm sorry. Well, if they don't have interactions with the larger world, uh -huh. would somebody be interested in world affairs? They could. I, I, I may be missing your question. They certainly could. Well, you know, Mr. Lawyer had an interest in ancient Rome, right? Yeah, yes. He shared that with his father, right? I don't know about his father's interest. His father didn't tell me that. No, didn't he tell you that he shared his interest in ancient Rome with his father? One of the few interests they shared. I don't recall. I don't recall the father. And Mr. Lawyer wasn't forced to join the Coast Guard, was he? No, he, he wanted to. And he was He had failed uh, as a... Uh, what was he, a merchandiser for Coca-Cola or something that only lasted a few months? Uh, he couldn't stand the, the working with the people, and the, I think he said the noise, uh, and then he enlisted in the Coast Guard in 2005. Is that in response to my question? I thought, I thought so. Okay. So when he joined the Coast Guard, he was stationed first in Virginia, right? Well, let me think. Um, I think so. And what was his task in Virginia? He was an IT, uh, he, I believe he went to uh, IT school, information technology school, and then uh, he was in uh, the IT department. Can you point to anything in the records during that period of time that caused the Coast Guard to feel he was suffering from mental illness? Um, in, did you say in the record, in the Coast Guard record? In any record that you reviewed. Well, he told me that he was having difficulties with the uh, co-workers. He, he uh, felt that back then in 2010 or so, he had uh, a period of depression. He didn't feel he fit in with the co-workers. What about California, when he went to California? I don't know if he was stationed there or he went for training there. I, I, I don't recall that he was stationed there. Was there anything in the record you can show that Anyone noticed that he was having mental health issues while he was in California? Again, I don't know that he was stationed there, but so the answer is no. I don't, I don't have any information about that. Would he have to be stationed there for someone to notice he was having mental health problems? No. I, I'm just trying to recall when he was in California and what I might know. He went to Alaska? Yes, sir. Other than the incident that we're talking about with Lisa, can you show me something in the records where anybody thought he was having mental health issues? Again, the investigation by the Coast Guard uh, would suggest that he was having mental health issues. That they recognized and sought treatment for him? No, they did not start treatment for him. And when he was then stationed in Virginia, correct? When he went to Chesapeake? Right. Yes. And in order to get to Virginia, did he tell you how he got to Virginia? He drove with his uh, friend, Jake, uh, from, I guess, California. I'm assuming, I don't know this, I'm assuming he took the ferry from Alaska to California, met Jake, and they, as I testified under direct, they stopped in El Paso, and that's when he found Tawny uh, on death's door. And uh, it's certainly important, isn't it, for you to get straight 
the history that he related to you, the order in which things happened? It's important, uh, but we're not, we're not foolproof, but it's important. Fair enough, fair enough. And didn't the trip with Jake take place before he went to Alaska, not after he left Alaska? I thought it was after, uh, on the way to Chesapeake. Uh, do you still think that now? I still do. I could be wrong, but I still do. So your understanding is Jake is with him when he finds his dog in distress. No, uh, I, I, no, uh, there, Jake was not with him at that time, no. Well, didn't you just say that he came from Alaska, went to where the dog was with Jake, and found the dog in distress. I could be wrong. Uh, I, it could be that Jake went into to Alaska and he was alone and found the dog. I, I'm sorry, I don't recall. It, it, it's fair to say that the, the dog is a very important event in his life, is it not? Yes, the dog is. Whether Jake was on the trip or not could be significant, but he, was, he definitely was not, Jake was definitely not there when he found the dog. And you indicated you had a chance to speak with Jacob Heller, correct? Uh, I indicated what, sir? You had an opportunity to speak with Jacob Heller, right? Yes, sir, I did. And you indicated something about how Jacob Heller was able to discuss or describe to you um, some schizoid symptoms, is that right? Well, he didn't use the word schizoid. No, he didn't, did he? No. That's your interpretation, right? That would be consistent with schizoid, yes. Did Jacob Heller tell you at that time he was concerned for the mental health of Mr. Lawyer? When I interviewed him? No, no. When you interviewed him and he was discussing with you the observations he made of Mr. Um, lawyer as they went across country. Oh, on that particular trip? Yeah. No, he didn't say that. Now, you indicated, did you not, that you were under the understanding he's suffering from a major depressive disorder, correct? Uh, I, I'm not sure what you're asking me. Is it my understanding? Is or? it your opinion that Mr. Lawyer is suffering from major depressive disorder? Yes. Right. Is that different or is it the same as depression? Well, that's a very good question. There's a continuum on, on uh, our understanding and diagnostic understanding of depression. There's a continuum. Uh, there's a milder depression that we have different terms for. It used to be called dysthymia. It's, it's now called a pervasive depression disorder, something like that. Um, and then farther down on the continuum, further down on the continuum, we have a major depressive disorder. Well, is it different from depression? Are they two different things? It's a continuum, so they're not two different things, but they're along a continuum. So you wouldn't agree then, sir, with the uh, idea that depression, say if somebody were to break up with a girlfriend, Say if some a loved one were to die. Say if they'd lost their job and they were feeling blue, mm -hmm. depressed. It's no different. It's on the same continuum as a major depressive disorder. It's correct? on the same continuum, yes. That's right. correct. So you would not agree. But it would not be clinically significant because it's part of the normal experience of human life that we might have those reactions. Um, and then we move down the continuum to a dysthymia and then we move to a major depressive disorder. So you wouldn't agree then, would you? with the statement that a major depressive disorder is a biochemical imbalance as opposed to a depressive situation would be just feeling blue and not necessarily biochemically re involved at all? Well, that's a very good question. Certainly, even in the lesser serious one, the less serious one, there are biochemical uh, underpinnings of our mood of depression. It affects the neuro transmitter operation of our bodies. So from that standpoint, all of them have a biochemical basis, all from mild to serious. Do people treat regular depression with chemicals? Do people treat regular depression with chemicals? Do you mean, would doctors prescribe antidepressants for a regular depression? Sure. For blue, feeling blue, they would. 
uh, again, it depends on a couple of factors. It would depend on this, uh, the, particularly depend on the length of time the person is being bl blue. How long is it going on? Are we not able to shake it? Um, the severity of it? Uh, those are factors that would be taken into consideration to decide whether to prescribe the medicine. And with respect to the P, uh, the page seven that uh, he received, uh, the, oh, okay. the uh -huh. page seven when he got right. to Chesapeake, uh -huh. did Mr. Lawyer know that there was an investigation that was ongoing? I believe so. And when he got to Chesapeake is when he first found out about the, P, the page seven. Is that fair to say? I believe so. And he felt that he was the person that was the victim there, correct? Yes. And what the piece, page seven was referring to, but they found him in fault four was what? For using his rank uh, to, I forget the exact wording, but instill amorous, uh, the word amorous is in there, some sort of amorous contact with the victim. And that's true, isn't it? Uh, not from his standpoint, that he was trying to instill it in her. Well, he was of a higher rank, wasn't he? Well, he certainly was, yes. And he was at a lower ranks apartment at 11 a.m., right? At 11 a.m.? 11 p. am sorry. He got there at the call at 11 p.m., and he was there until early morning hours, right? Yes. That's all true, that? That's certainly true, yes. <laughs> That's based in reality, isn't it? That's based in reality. She, he, she had invited him over, according to him. And now you stated that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but after he received the page seven, he started to deteriorate mentally? Yes, well, further deteriorate, yes. No one noticed that at the base, did they? Well, let's see, at Chesapeake, um, uh, I'm not aware of him, of his being written up for any sort of problem at that point, no. <clears throat> and, would you agree with me that Mr. Lawyer became angry when he realized <clears throat> he could be in trouble for having been at the apartment of an enlisted woman who was under his reign when he was in Kodiak, Alaska? I agree with the statement, the sentence you just said, yes. So it goes beyond, it goes beyond just the idea of the migrant, isn't that right? Yes, I think I said under direct, it, it proceeded to the, uh, uh, page seven exacerbated the whole situation. The motivation for him to file a complaint in the whole situation was that he could get in trouble, right? That was part of the motivation. And he wanted to nip that in the butt, as it were. Part of the motivation, you're absolutely correct. Now, you indicated that, in your opinion, Mr. Lawyer has, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced this too, eidetic memory? Oh, I said eidetic memory, right. Uh, would that but, be, okay. What were you going to say? Okay, would that be like photographic memory? Yes. All right. <laughs> I thought that's what you were going to say. Fair enough. And you indicated that he would, in the lawyer wars, it'd be like what, every people, what people were wearing, the weather. I did say that. I. I hope I got the details right, but my point was that his recollection of all these details was astonishing in that document. And when you say the weather, can, or what somebody's wearing, would it be like, oh, they're wearing a blue jacket that day with uh, stripes? And How would you describe how he would be so iodetic with respect to what people were wearing? He just, uh, again, I, I, I don't have it in front of me, that document, but it's 200 pages of recollection of minute details that most of us in this room would, most, most people would not remember. Minute details about very significant events in his mind, right? No, some of them weren't significant. Some of them were, well, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I spoke too quickly. Yeah, I guess they were significant in his mind, yes. What did he write about his memories of high school? I think, um, I don't recall that there was a writing on that topic off the top of my head. But doesn't he say he doesn't remember much about high school he except the swim team? He told me that, yes. But I don't know that that was a document that he said that. Well, in any event, the person with you say eidetic memory tells you he doesn't remember much about his high school. 
That's correct. That's correct. He, he remembers with astonishing detail his interactions with the victim. Uh, but that's right. He told me he does not recall much about his childhood, for that matter, or his high school. Now, when Mr. Lawyer was in Kodiak, do you know what his living arrangements were? My recollection is that he was on the base for a while, and then he was off base. And what does that, what's the difference between being on base and off base? No, I'm not a Coast Guard uh, uh, veteran. I, I'm assuming it has to do with be, having some, uh, being on the base uh, in, in a dormitory. I, I, I don't know how it works. So in your 43 hours of interviewing Mr. Lloyd, you never asked him what the difference was between living on base and living off base, correct? That's correct, I did not. And yet you say that he joined the Coast Guard because the rules in the formality of it fit into his, I don't want to say disease, but his mental health at that time, right? Yeah, I don't want to be picky. I don't think I said it that way. I said the organization and structure, uh, but, I, but I, I, that was my opinion about why he joined uh, the, the Coast Guard, but I, I don't know his living arrangement, the difference between on base or off base. But would it be important to know whether or not he could feed himself, clothe himself, pay his bills, maintain a car, <clears throat> things of that nature, as opposed to having the Coast Guard do that all for him? Um, I suppose so. And you inter also, when you were talking about him being like a loner, when he went to the morale events, do you know, did he have to go to those? I don't think it was mandatory, but I, I could be wrong. I, so he would have chose to go to those? I think so. The get-togethers that he had at his own house? Yes. He would have been the one that invited people to come, right? That's my understanding. He would have chose the people to come, right? That's my understanding. And he did have a circle of friends, did he not, while he was at the base? Yes. And when you indicated that he was be a loner and would be playing his video games, or I think you said computer, I apologize, you said computer, correct? Uh, I might have said video games and Star Wars and computer. Okay. So it would also involve the video games and computer, correct? Did you know? And Star Wars. And Star Wars. Well, that would be watching a movie. Right. Would you know whether or not he would be playing alone, or would he be playing with others using the internet? Mostly alone, but sometimes with others. Mostly alone. So if you were to find out that he was playing uh, these video games with other people often, would that change your opinion at all? Not, not at all. That's not uncommon at all, uh, particularly given that you don't have direct, uh, you know, face-to-face -face contact with that kind of uh, competition on the, on the uh, computer. So when you say face-to-face, -face, if you had a setup where you can see the person you're playing and you're interacting with them while you're playing the game, that wouldn't qualify in face-to-face, -face, would it? Well, yeah, yes, it would qualify as face-to-face, -face, but it wouldn't have the same social context as when you're with somebody in the same room. Are you aware that Jacob Heller indicated they often played that type of a game where they'd be able to see each other while they're playing a game against themselves in other people that were online as well? I'm not aware of that, but it wouldn't surprise me at all. Uh, uh, that kind of interaction would be in keeping with somebody uh, with that diagnosis. And then you also indicated, did you not, that you weren't surprised to find out that he didn't complete his post high school college. Is that fair to say? His, 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 his post high school, you mean his year in college? Yes. I wasn't surprised by that, right. And you indicated that was because why? Uh, I think I gave several reasons. One is that he was uh, terrible with homework all along. Uh, number two, I think I said that that kind of independent living that, uh, that, that many of us went through when we went to college as opposed to being in the primary home uh, was a factor. And I think I gave a third, oh, the social interaction that would be uh, more prominent in college. Uh, I think I gave those reasons. Do you know where he was living when he attended the community college? He had his home at a, with his father. You indicated that his swimming would have been a solitary event, correct? Yes, sir. Do you swim alone during the meets? No, you don't swim alone, but it's not like uh, other types of uh, competitive sports that rely more on a team uh, cohesion and team coordination. 
Do you know if he was on a team or did he swim along? I believe he was on a team. I, I, I didn't. All I know is uh, in that regard is that he won the uh, high school district. I, I don't know the answer to that. Do you know whether or not his team had a relay? I don't know. That would be a team part of swimming, wouldn't it, if you involved in a relay? But it's not the same as other types of sports, Mr. Assistant District Attorney, with a high level, a higher level of coordination and cohesiveness. And you indicated that when he was in school that he would be called Lurch, is that right? Yeah, that's what he told me. Right. And, and, his, and his mother confirmed that he had been bullied. You know who Lurch is, right? From the Adams family. Right. And how tall is Mr. Lawyer? He's fairly tall. I, I don't know his exact height. Well, would 6'3 sound about right to you? I don't know. All right. And do you know how tall he was when he was called Lurch? I don't. And you indicated there was also a fight that he got involved in when he was being bullied. Is that right? Uh, yes. He told me about it, and I believe his mother confirmed it. And so when he was bullied, he reacted by getting in a fight. On that, that right? on that one instance, he did. Or did he tell you about other instances where he was being bullied and he didn't get in the fight? By default, meaning that he told me about other times he'd been bullied, that there were no fights uh, associated, so it's by default he told me. So you're saying he did or didn't tell you? He didn't tell me about any other fights. Now you mentioned his dog, Tawny, is that right? I did. That was important to him, wasn't it? Very important. How many times did you talk about Tawny? I wouldn't say more than more than a couple of times. All right. Would they be in two different occasions in the 43 hours that you met with him? I don't recall. Uh, yes, I think they would have been, but I really don't recall for sure. What was his demeanor when you talked about Tani? I'd have to check my notes. He might have been tearful at one of those times. I don't recall. When you say he might, he might not have been? You're right. I don't recall without checking my notes. So it certainly didn't stand out to you right now to tell us, oh, he lost control. He was a, a sobbing, crying uncontrollable emotions being shown? I think that's fair to say. I didn't uh, make a mental note that I was concentrating on other matters more than that. However, uh, at the same time, it was clear to me that this was a very momentous occasion for him uh, about Tawny's condition and euthanizing the dog. Did he indicate he was extremely angry when he saw the condition of the dog? Yes. Did he indicate who he blamed? His father. He hasn't done anything to his father, has he? Uh, other than cut off any relationship with him. Right, right. But he didn't kill him, did he? He did not, to my knowledge. What, didn't you talk to him? I did. I don't know what's happened since then, but that was not the case when I spoke with him in See, 2015. He's had the opportunity to kill his father? I, I object, I father. object, Your Honor. Sustained, sustained. You indicated that you were talking about, at some point, when he got the page seven, that was much like what happened to the characters in Star Wars, right? And then you even mentioned a couple of characters. You said Captain Khan and Captain Kirk, right? He did tell me about Captain Khan, Captain Kirk, yes. All right, and it, it, it's important, isn't it, for you to make sure that you understand what he's saying if you're going to be making a, a, a form an opinion as to whether he's suffering from a mental disease or defect, isn't it? It is important, but as you agreed with me a moment ago, we're not foolproof. And how did he relate how it was like the Star Wars characters? Did he give you specific examples? About how, how he related to them? Right. The, you said the page seven, it was much like the characters in Star Wars. Then you said something about Captain Khan and Captain Kirk. Tell us what he said about that. I don't know that the that those are juxtaposed. I don't know that he was telling me about Captain Khan versus Captain Kirk at the time that he was discussing with me receiving the page seven. I, if I testified to that effect, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't think I meant there was a juxtaposition between the two. He, in my rec recollection, we're talking about two different uh, time frames of discussion. Fair enough. So tell us what is it that he was discussing when he mentioned Captain Khan and Captain Kirk? Uh, that uh, I think as I testified, Captain Khan was Captain Kirk's uh, enemy and would go to any lengths to defeat him. Uh, and I believe he used the term uh, 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 to unreasonable extents. 
And who was he identifying with, if you know? I don't know. Okay. You know that Captain Khan and Captain Kirk are from Star Trek, right? Not mm -hmm. from Star Wars. From uh, Star Trek, right. Now, you indicated that he has feelings of detachment. <clears throat> Let me see counsel at the side uh, for a second. <clears throat> See you at 9 tomorrow. Now, I can't predict how far we're going to get it's it. Not it's not gone. It's gone. But I would like to see you at 9 tomorrow. Now, I can't predict how far we're going to get it. It's not it's it's not gone. Gone. It's but I would like to think by tomorrow, midday, you'll be out to the way. I'm not positive. I hope so. With that thought in mind, once a jury goes out to deliberate, it's entirely up to the jury how long they deliberate. And there is no minimum, there is no maximum time for a jury's deliberation. It's in the hands of the jury. If a jury reports to a judge around 4 o'clock in, in the afternoon, the jurors would like to adjourn and come back the next business day to continue deliberations, that's normally allowed. Also, if a jury reports at that time in the afternoon, more or less, that they'd like to stay and continue deliberations, that's usually also allowed as well, depending on staff ability, of availability. So what I'm suggesting to you is build some leeway into your late afternoon and evening, evening activities tomorrow. I can't predict. You may well be a jury out deliberating. I don't know. Tomorrow morning, 9 a.m. Ever mind. With all my admonitions. Jurors, all rise.